Ah. <laughs> this was a very friendly welcome to our guest of today. Thank you. Mr. Lars Thompson. He's a very famous uh, futurist. Uh, I can't say this word. Futurist. Futurist, thank you. Yeah. And we are very proud to have him here tonight and also tomorrow at our workshop of the seminar. Um, yeah, why? Everybody may ask why. I would try to make it short. Uh, Magnetic is now 32 and a half years or almost even longer old. And so we have quite a long history, but I hope that we will also have a very long future. And as everybody has noticed, future ha takes place in an even more accelerated manner. And so we have to take care that we don't look too much back and don't yes, be able to, to, to see the things which are happening right now. And we feel that there's a lot of trends which we have already more or less in hands, uh, which are in front of us, which we have to cope with. And uh, we hope that Mr. Thompson can help us to make the right decisions, to have the right views, and uh, to predict things which are very important for us. And I would like to say, sometimes uh, this uh, science of looking into the future is probably something which is, uh, yeah, it's like looking into a glass ball and things like that. I'm a physicist, I always tended to say, yes, it's right, forget these guys. But I feel that it is now time to change <laughs> your minds also in this respect. <coughs> we must yeah, also take into account different things in order to make the right decisions because we have no time to lose and wrong decisions or late decisions is the worst what can happen. Mr. Thompson, please. Thank you very much. Good evening and thank you for inviting me to Hungary. Um, I uh, personally was the first time in Budapest when I was uh, five years old. Um, and that had to do, my father was an engineer, um, a civil engineer, building houses and um, garages and stuff like that. And um, back then, he, there was a lack in Germany for good engineers and architects. So he reached out to some uh, Hungarian um, architects and engineers and uh, they worked for him and that was 30, 35 years ago, more than that, I mean I'm 48 now, 40 years ago. And um, so they came over to Hamburg where I uh, grew up and we became friends and over the years I mean I have really experienced so much friendship um, from these people because they have been working for my father and when I was growing up they invited me over to come over to Budapest and, and to spend time with them and every time I came they basically gave me their apartment and filled up the refrigerator and gave me their car and stuff like that so it's great to give something back from, uh, from, from my perspective to, to Hungary um, today. What I want to do with you in the next um, 60 minutes is to step into a helicopter and look on our present from a different perspective. Because oftentimes we are very caught up in the today's things, of the things that we have to accomplish today or probably doing this week. And then we have probably some plans for the fall or what we want to do for Christmas. But what I want to do is take a look into the year 2026. 2026, 10 years from now. Now, when we are talking about the future, um, many people say, well, looking 10 years into the future, 2026 looks very, very far away. For many people say, we cannot even imagine what 2017 or 2018 or 2019 or 2020 is going to look like. 2026, I mean, why don't you come back in five years from now because it's you know, far, far away. Now, just think about that. If we are thinking about 10 years, is 10 years a long or a short period of time? The, the, older, the older you get, the more you will argue it's short, because when you look back in the year 2006, and you think about, okay, 2006, now it's 2016, 
did it really take that long or did the time went by very fast? Especially if you have children. You know, they grow up so quickly and you can't imagine that, you know, they've grown up already and it's just, you know, 10 years, wow. And in the f looking into the future seems to be much longer. So there might be something different when we are, you know, looking into the future or into the past and the reason why we are taking a different measurement of looking into the future um, is the following. How, f how far in weeks is um, September of 2026 away from us? It's a very easy calculation. It's about, it's about 520 weeks. Yeah, it's 52 weeks to a year at times 10, 520. Now, um, in a few days, in three days from now, when, when I calculate collect correctly, we are uh, on a Friday again, and uh, you know that a week is very short, a working week, many of the things that you wanted to do yesterday on Monday, you will not be able to finish until Friday, because we are living in a time where so many changes are coming into our lives, so much information that we have to deal with, so many interactions that we have with partners and suppliers and other people that we are communicating with, that oftentimes on a Friday, like in three days from now, you will look onto your desk and you will you know, sort all these things out that, you, that you've seen on your desk, trying to figure out, okay, what, was, what, what do I have to do until you know, today because I, I cannot postpone it to Monday. Um, oftentimes on a Friday afternoon, you will say, can't believe the week is already over and um, uh, I have really not accomplished that much that I wanted to do. Now we do that 520 times like on a Friday, you know, in three days from now, and then we are already in the year 2026. It's only 500 short weeks. Now in this time, there will be more changes in the way we work, in the way we use technology, in the way we use artificial intelligence, in the way that uh, we are looking at mobility, for example, and in the energy system than that we've seen in the last 500 weeks. And that has to do with the fact that the speed of innovation has increased um, with the technology that we're using. We are right now globally connected. Everyone has the internet in their pockets. We can um, communicate in peer groups in a matter of seconds via you know, social networks and stuff like that. And that is not only on the private sector, but also in the world of technology and the world of business. So we can expect that there's more complexity and that there's more um, innovation coming. And just imagine, if we had met 520 weeks ago today, um, in 2006. And I remember 2006 good because those of you who are, who have, um, are football fans and those of you who are from Germany or you know, in Germany probably remember the summer of 2006 pretty good because anybody knows what happened in uh, 2006 in the summer in Germany? Well, it was um, the, the World Soccer Championship uh, tournament in Germany. We had good weather all the, t all the way and actually it was a first time for Germany as well because before that date we didn't really show our national flag because we were always ashamed of um, putting you know, the, 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 the flags out and all of a sudden people were proud of you know, this, this flag again and put them on their cars and on, onto their houses and stuff like that and it was such a good time. And if I ask people, do you remember that time and how was it, they say, it's just like yesterday. And then I ask them, okay, what was the most popular app that people used on their smartphones during that uh, summer of 2006? Did the people look up the TV program, which game was on at uh, uh, 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock p.m. or the, the actual tournament uh, numbers and and people think about it, and I saw somebody, saw somebody of you here in the audience saying no. And actually, we didn't have any idea that something like an app would ever exist. We didn't even, you know, we couldn't imagine that even our children have devices in their pockets where they can use their fingers on a glass screen to enlarge a photo that they've taken with that, with a resolution that is beyond the capabilities of the cameras in the stadiums 
that provided the picture for the, for the world. So we didn't have 4K cameras in, in back then, it was just HDTV. It was 2007, 2007, one year later, and in weeks, it's about 470, 480 weeks ago, when Steve Jobs came onto a stage, pulled up a small device, and said, we call it the iPhone. And that was the first time that a computer company went into the phone business and said, we are not only dividing, making a phone, but we are building a computer that is also a phone. Now, back then, I was consulting with Nokia. Some of you remember this company, and Nokia was the, market, the world market leader for mobile phones in 2006. Actually, they had market shares in some markets more than 50%. Worldwide, they had like 38, 37, 38% market share. Um, you know, through the, the world, everybody was having a Nokia phone. And they came from an era where they were very innovative. They first produced rubber boots, then they produced cables and uh, plastics and, and uh, rubber for, for cables. Then they produced telephone cables um, for normal telephones, and then they came up with a mobile phone. And everybody liked it, and everybody loved the, you know, the, the new GSM system and everybody. And then all of a sudden, this guy from California said, OK, we are calling it the iPhone, and it's a computer, and it costs about $499 with a two-year contract and you know, a very expensive thing. And do you know what Nokia did? They laughed. And they said, nobody's going to buy this phone because you know, people have laptops, people have Nokia phones. Why should they buy something that is expensive that you, know, you already have? You have it on your laptop or you have your phone. Now, Steve Jobs also said another thing. He said, if a trend becomes obvious, you're too late. If a trend becomes obvious, you're too late. Um, auf Deutsch, uh, if I, when, when a trend of offensichtlich wird, then seid ihr zu spät. And the Nokia people didn't get it. And their strategy was, let's wait and see if people want to have that. The funny thing is, uh, when it was introduced, um, they said, OK, it's going to be, in, uh, be, gonna be in the stores. On, in, in Germany, it was in, in March. I think it was March 30th, 2008. And people camped in front of the Apple stores. And Nokia said, oh, God, those are the freaks. I mean, you know, once they have their iPhone, nobody else is going to buy it because, you know, those are just the, the people with the Apple stickers on their car. And, you know. Second quarter came and the iPhone, you know, was very popular. It couldn't do, do supply demand. Third quarter, even more. Fourth quarter. Then they introduced the next uh, uh, iPhone, the iPhone 3 with uh, GSM or 3G and a second camera to the front. And after five quarters, only uh, about 70 weeks, 70 weeks, Nokia said, oh, hmm, I think this is a trend. Let's go and run after them. Well, um, the Nokia is not what it's used to be. It's been bought, the, the, the mobile phone sector was bought by, uh, by Microsoft a couple of years ago, and they lost the market share. If a trend becomes obvious, you're too late. And that only happened in 70 weeks, 70 times a Friday, like in three days from now. And that's a very, very short time, but it sees you know, how, how quick markets change. One thing is important. The iPhone is a perfect example for what we call a tipping point. And a tipping point is a point in time at which a new technology, a new paradigm, how to use things, comes into place and people really get it and you get an exponential growth. It's not like a normal growth curve that where you have a stable, um, you know, like a 3% or 5% um, increase, but it's a curve that is, you know, the smartphone market in 2005, 2006, 2007, there were some. I mean, you had the Nokia communicator and you had a BlackBerry and stuff like that, but they had a market share of less than 1%. And then all of a sudden, um, you had an exponential growth in smartphones because um, you had the batteries that you needed to power these devices. 
You had to have the network connections and the mobile internet. You had to have the screen that you could use and have a sensitive touch screen in there. And all these things came together at a very, very certain point. Now, as Dr. Fech said, you know, um, sometimes you are curious to know, can you really predict the future? And it's, it's hard. It's hard to predict the future. And many people doubt that anybody can predict the future. Well, I will prove to you that you can. And there's a very, very interesting, very easy experiment how to um, show how to predict the future, and everybody can do that. And that's the, um, the experiment of making popcorn. Have you ever made popcorn yourself? Okay, most of you probably did. And there are modern ways of doing popcorn or making popcorn in the microwave. No, we are doing it in a pot. We are taking a pot. And we are filling uh, into the pot about half a centimeter of heat-resistant oil, sunflower oil. And then we take a handful of kernels, popcorn kernels, and put them into the pot. We don't need more than one handful. And we put the lid on the top, on, 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 the, on the pot, and put it on the stove, and we apply heat. Now, over a long period of time, nothing happens. The, hot, the, the pot heats up. And, you know, you see the little red light on the, on the stove flashing on, and you feel the pot, yeah, it's getting hotter. But um, nothing has happened. Now, you can take some of your colleagues or friends or even family members and get them around the pot and saying, OK, let's you know, make a guess. When do you think we'll get the first popcorn? And there will be three different types of people are three different types of guessing when to get popcorn. About 10% of the people, so if you have a group of 10 people, one will be always ahead of their time and will, you know, will get ner nervous after about 30 seconds and say, OK, don't get, go away. I mean, it's, it's going to pop any, any second now. It's, it's going to be very fast. And those are the 10% of people who are always too early in the development. I mean, I oftentimes, you know, being counted to this, um, you know, first 10% because I think it's, going, it's happening much faster than in reality, but okay. Nothing happened after 30 seconds. Nothing happens after 60 seconds. And then after about a minute and a half, not after 90 seconds, you will hear a diff a, d d d some other people coming to order, and they will say, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. You know, you can turn it off. I mean, we don't need popcorn. We can take potato chips or whatever. The film is starting. Shut it off. It's probably the, the, the wrong kernels or whatever. And those are the doubters who don't believe that there will be a tipping point. And they do, they are, well, their prognosis of the future is very easy. They say, OK, it's very easy. The last 90 seconds, nothing happened. So the next 90 seconds, nothing will happen as well. Hmm. What is the third? group of people? Probably our children or those who have uh, protected their curiosity um, over, over time. And actually now, after Steve Jobs presented this thing about 480 weeks ago, we all have access to the wisdom and the knowledge of the world in our pockets. And the third group is doing you know, what they do 260 times a day in statistical things, they pull out their smartphones and they Google popcorn. Now, when you Google popcorn, you see a lot of things you know, coming up in the list. You see pictures of popcorn. But you also see um, the Wikipedia page uh, where popcorn is described. And that's always a good way to start. Uh, because Wikipedia is, you know, an encyclopedia uh, online that you can use to, to, to get knowledge very fast. And in this page, you will see popcorn pops between 163 and 168 degrees Celsius. And it also explains why it pops. Because you see that the popcorn is um, cut in half, and the schematics shows that um, the popcorn kernel consists of three different layers. The skin that uh, goes into your, um, between your teeth um, that you really don't want to have, but it's still there. <laughs> the, 
Then you have a layer of dried cornstarch, um, getrocknete Maisstärke auf Deutsch. Um, uh, dried cornstarch, which is very hard. Uh, if you bite on it, you can break your tooth. But it's dried out by the sun um, while uh, in, in the summer, and it's become very hard. But in the middle of this kernel, there is still the seed. And the seed is surrounded by a little bit of water. Well, it's, it's mice oil, or uh, corn oil, mice oil, and water. Well, you know, when we learned in physics in fifth grade or sixth grade about water, we knew that water consists in three different stages. Hard water, ice, uh, minus 273 degrees until zero degrees. Then we see a tipping point where the ice turns into water between you know, minus one and plus one degrees, it becomes liquid. And then again, at 100 degrees, it turns into vapor. And all these three things have totally different um, 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 char characteristics, because water you cannot compress, but vapor builds up a lot of pressure that you can compress. Now, you can calculate how long it takes for the oil to heat up and the energy to transfer through this dried cornstarch um, layer into the seed era where the water starts to boil and to develop um, a massive amount of, of pressure. And there's a point at which this pressure is too big to be contained into, in this kernel. Um, and that's about 9.5 bar that this kernel can take in pressure. And then it pops, it explodes, and, it, and, 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 and the, the vapor uh, diffuses into the, the, the wet cornstarch that is still in there and blows it up by the factor 10. So that's why it happens. Now, the funny thing is, even if you have never made popcorn in your life before, never, but you have a thermometer and you have Wikipedia, you can predict the time at which the popcorn pops now that you know what's going on in the system very precisely, within 10 seconds. You can be very cool at 30 seconds, at 60 seconds, at 90 seconds, and then you, the, the, the thermo thermometer reaches 136, uh, 163 degrees and say, okay, two, uh, three, two, one, and it's going to, to happen. And that's a prediction of the future. It has to do with our ability to understand systems. Now, corn, you know, popcorn is a very simple system, but many of the things that are happening in our world have the same sort of logic if you are understanding the system. And probably Stephen, Steve Jobs was right when he said, if a trend becomes obvious, you're too late. Because at the popcorn example, you can see exactly the same thing. It took a long time before we've reached the tipping point at which the first popcorn pops over two minutes in normal cases. And then the first popcorn pops. Does it take another two minutes before the second popcorn pops? No. It goes pop, 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 pop. And within 10 seconds, the whole pot is full of popcorn. Actually, when the first popcorn pops, you can take the, you can take the, um, the pot off the stove. You can lift it up to, uh, you know, to, to put it on the other side where it's cold. You cannot stop the system because it's boiling everywhere. You cannot stop the trend. If a trend becomes obvious, you're too late. That's why Nokia is bankrupt, or you know, chapter 11, to be honest, in, in the phone business, and Apple is still there because they have calculated the tipping point right. Now, what are the tipping points that we, what, what we see for the next 520 weeks? What, we, what do we see until 2026? And I want to take you on a journey uh, with me um, with about five trends I'm going to cover where we are seeing tipping points, points where we have uh, something that uh, flips. The first one is a very technical one, and it has to do with computers and the Internet of Things and Industry 4.0 um, and digitalization of our world. Uh, we are calling this tipping point the end of stupidity, das Ende der Dummheit. Now, um, the end of stupidity, das Ende der Dummheit, 
um, is a very funny thing uh, for a trend, or for a funny name for a trend, but um, I want to explain what's happening. Until now, when we worked with technology, when you know, everyone in this room, uh, you're working with computers. You're having a smartphone or a laptop or whatever, and most of you um, have been told that if you had a new computer, you, your work would be easier because the computer would do the work for you or you could work everywhere and it's an intelligent machine. And until now, this was a promise to be broken because never, you know, computers today that you buy, they really don't understand what you're doing. They are not learning with you. And it takes a certain amount of, um, of computing power and algorithms and, and, and the way that you know, the, 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 the system develops to reach a point at which systems can learn by itself. And guess what? 2015, 16, 17, and 18 are the four years, the 200 weeks, that we are seeing the shift from dumb computers that cannot learn and think and share their information to a world at which they can. They are learning, they are seeing, they are hearing, they are understanding, they are getting better. And you can see that in, in many, many ways. Um, let's say, um, for example, self-driving cars. Um, many people said, self-driving cars we will not see until 10, 2030. And people told me, well, you know, to have a self-driving car, you have to have to have to have a computer that can see better and react better uh, than a human being. And it's hard, because if you're driving a car through the roads, you are doing quite a lot of computing. Um, it's a routine job, but your eyes have to scan the street. And they have to look, OK, there's a signpost. And it has a round sign with a red circle and a white uh, thing, and it says 60 on it. And you know, OK, the 60 means it's uh, 60 kilometers. Then your eyes have to shift from uh, looking into the, in, in, into the uh, distance to short distance viewing on your tachometer and seeing, OK, there's a little needle, and it's between 50 and 60. And then your brain has to say, OK, I feel the resistance of my left foot on the accelerator pedal, and I have to rela relax uh, two or three muscles to lift, or no, actually to, to push the pedal a little bit deeper and to, uh, to, to sh shift back and forth your, your focus point between the this needle that you're looking at and uh, the other things. And you're seeing people walking on the one side of the street, and you're seeing children playing with a ball over there, and you're seeing a dog running on this side, and you hear a noise from behind, and you feel that your, um, uh, your steering wheel shakes a little bit, and you're thinking, well, I probably have to get the tires checked. And you're calling home you know, using your phone and discussing uh, what's for dinner tonight. And you can do all this while driving a car. Your brain can actually process about 15 different impulses every second. If you're awake, and if you're not drunk. So if you're, a little, you know, if, if you're very tired, it goes down to seven or six. And you know the times when you're really falling asleep, then your, your brain process only about one or two impulses per second. But if you're awake and if you're not drunk, 15 impulses per second. And that's very hard because uh, you see so many things. And to filter out the right information is a very hard thing. Now, computers last year we're able to do about eight different impulses or to process eight different impulses every second. And those computers were very big. You had to have the whole trunk of the car full of computers, the highest resolution cameras. And the problem is the cameras provided 30 frames per second, 30 pictures of pixels. And all the computers saw are you know, dots that had different colors. And you had to filter out. This, you know, this thing that, OK, this is the sign for this, for the speed, and this is a dog, and this is a child, and this is a ball, and this is you know, rattling from the thing. It's, it, it was really hot. But computing power increases. Um, it doubles almost every 15 months. Now, if you double something 10 times, 
you get quite a lot. You know probably the experiment that, that we had it in school, where our teacher asked us, okay, take a corn of rice in a chessboard, put one corn of rice on A1, and then double it from field to field. And I was asked as a student, okay, what do you think you get after 10 fields? And then I guessed, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 grains of, <laughs> of, of uh, rice. I was wrong. And actually, I know the numbers now because over the last 10 years when I bought my first digital camera, I bought me a chip with one megabyte um, storage capacity. Well, probably a little bit more. Well, might make it easy. But the, the year after it, I could buy for the same price two. And the year after, four megabytes. And then eight, and then 16, and then 32, and then 64, and then 128, 260, uh, 256, 200, 512. And after 10 years, I could buy a gigabyte, which is 1,024 times as much as the one that I bought uh, 10 years ago. The same is true with computing power. And 2016 was the year when we actually had a car that had the ability to process 16, 16 impulses per second. Um, and next year, we have a car that processes about 32 um, uh, impulses per, per second. And the year after, it's 64, and then it's 128. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, driving a car as a human, where you can process 15 different informations, or a car that can process 128 different inf informations uh, per, um, uh, per second, um, hmm, which one is safer? And the funny thing is, if you've ever written a self-driving car, it's quite amazing. I was able to do that with Google in uh, Mountain View um, earlier, uh, well, it was last year already, fall of 2015. And Google is experimenting with self-driving cars. They have a Lexus 350 uh, RH with a uh, LiDAR sensor in top. And now they have these small cars. You probably see in the picture of the small Panda Google car uh, that they are driving around. Actually, if you go to Palo Alto or Mountain View, you see them on the streets. They are very common. They are just like as common as seeing a, let's say, a Skoda Octavia or something. It's very, very, very. Um, uh, easy to see. Now the funny thing is the first time you get into it, you're really scared. Because you're sitting on, on, this, on, 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 this, on the chair or on the, on the seat, and there's no steering wheel and there's no pedals. The only thing you can do is you hold on to the handle right here and you rest your right arm on, a, uh, on the console where you have like a joystick type of thing and a button where you can have the emergency off switch. Now, the Google engineer gets into the car with you and say, okay, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a key and I, <laughs> how do I make this thing move? And he says, you gotta talk to the car. Okay, so, okay, Google, uh, <laughs> let's go to Starbucks. And then it shows all the Starbucks restaurants uh, on, on a map and you push on it and then you say, okay, Google, go. And then the car makes two beeps, beep, beep, and it starts to go. And you're coming to the first curve and you're getting really scared. I mean, <laughs> should I push the, the emergency off button or you know what? And oh, it's coming to the curve. Ah, made it quite good, okay. Second curve is a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> and after 10 curves, you're totally relaxed and say, okay, do the driving. You're looking out the window, waving to the kids, they're making photos with the, with the iPhone, talking to the engineer. And all of a sudden, you're at, 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 at Starbucks. It, you know, you really didn't, don't notice it. And what the engineer told me is, the, the funny thing is, this Google car has been programmed to drive the ideal curve every time. Now, how do you drive an ideal curve? And that's a tricky thing. I mean, you've probably learned it in driving school once, if you had a good instructor. If you're riding down the road and there's a curve coming, you have to calculate with your eyes and your brains and the experience that you have um, to find the right point to brake because you have to reduce your velocity or your, your speed uh, until the beginning of the curve. Now, you shouldn't brake into the curve. You should uh, decelerate to the beginning of the curve then don't accelerate and don't push the, the accelerator but, uh, uh, pedal 
turn into the curve with the right angle, and once you hit the apex of the curve, you can gradually increase the speed again and straighten up the steering wheel. Now, if you do that, and you do it perfectly, uh, everybody will say, hey, great driving. I mean, okay. But in the real world, mm, the Google car has GPS data, it has laser vision, it knows exactly where it is, and it, it learns every time it drives a curve, if it's driven the curve good or not, and it shares this information in the cloud so that every other car that is going to drive this curve in the future will have this data available as well. And it's perfect, great. And then you're going back to your hotel. You're driving back to the Google campus and saying, okay, I need a taxi to my hotel. And you're saying, I can't believe it. this taxi driver cannot drive the car at all. I mean, he's driving too, he's, he's braking too early or too late. He's turning into the curve and, and, and realizing, okay, I need a little bit more steering, or he's, he's braking again because he's realizing he's too, he's too fast, or he's pushing the accelerator. And you, and you just want to share your experiences from the Google car with your family on WhatsApp, but you cannot because your head is going like this and uh, your hands are going like this. Now, we are coming to the point at which we all have to accept that robots, computers, artificial intelligence, self-driving cars will drive better than humans. And in 500 weeks, believe it or not, you will pay more insurance money if you want to drive your car yourself because the, the, um, the um, probability of you making a mistake is much, much higher than driving, driving in a car that can um, you know, see at night and see through fog and don't get tired and don't drink alcohol and, you know, all these things. So you will have to decide whether or not you want to be driven and pay less insurance or if you want to drive yourself and, okay, pay for the fun. Um, but probably eventually, in some point in time, um, the governments will say it's too dangerous to let people um, drive um, you know, machines that weigh 1,500 or 2,000 kilograms and then go 200 kilometers an hour. But we are very um, close to this thing. Now, this is to do with artificial intelligence. It also um, implies that our work in the future will change because more and more we will rely, every one of us, on artificial intelligence doing routine jobs. And it's not only driving our cars, it's also answering our emails. Google, for example, right now in beta, if you have Gmail or Google Mail, you can actually allow Google to analyze what's in your email, and it learns um, by the way you answer it. And the next time you get a similar email, the system will say, I can answer it for you if, 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 if you want to. So it seems like science fiction, but in, in about 250 weeks, by 2020, 2021 at the latest, you will come into the office and your computer will store 50 new emails. And you're saying, oh, <laughs> I have other things to do than reading 50 emails. But the good thing is you power up your computer and the computer will say, okay, you've got 50 new emails, but 46 of them I could answer myself. And for the last four, I've prepared something you know, that you have to take a look at. Now, that seems like Hmm, scary on the, un uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it is very, very necessary that we will give routine jobs to computer in the future. Because otherwise, every one of us will go insane. Because we are still doubling the amounts of emails that we are getting every three years. Uh, and, you know, we cannot double the amount of capacity in our brains. And we have to let go of so many routine jobs that we have to open up for innovation and creativity. It also has implications on our society because many of the jobs that are doing just routine, job, routine jobs, doing the same every day, will be replaced by computers. And to be honest, we are a little bit scared of um, the next 10 years that we are coming into a crisis of work, that we are, we are calling it the crisis of work, um, at which um, we will be able to replace about 30 to 40%, 30 to 40% of all jobs today from driving a taxi to, a, um, to someone who's making your taxes or um, 
um, um, you know, working in a supermarket, filling up the, um, uh, the different shelves, will be replaced by robots and, and artificial intelligent machines in the future. And that will have a huge impact, not only for Hungary or for Germany, but for the US, for Japan, for China, for every industrialized nation that we have. Um, I don't want to go into that, but um, one thing is for sure, there have been innovations and inventions in the past that have changed the way that we live and the way that we view work and how jobs evolved. Just think about it. Before the invention of the steam engine, most of the people worked with their muscles to provide food and to you know, work on a field and, and basically had to use their muscle power to do, to do everything or to use a horse or a donkey to transport something just a few kilometers. And all of a sudden we had a machine that produced, it, that produced much more power than the muscles of a human or a horse. And the world changed. And it didn't change for the worse, but it changed for the better. Because beforehand we had about 40 different um, Berufe, um, professions, professions, 40. And after the steam engine, we had about 300 engineers and you know, people you know, who, who, who were in the logistics industry and transport and, 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 and plant machinery and stuff like that. Now we are at the point at which we are inventing a new machine that is not replacing muscle power, but routine work with our brains. And it's going to be just as dramatic as the uh, steam engine was. This is going to happen in the next 500 weeks. And that's uh, probably bigger, much bigger than the internet and the mobile internet um, that we've seen. And it's going to affect um, many of us. We'll discuss about this later. But let's, let's go to other forms that are where we see tipping points at the moment. One is energy. Now, <coughs> over the last 150 years, and it also had to do with the steam engine, we have started to use fossil fuels or fossil energy in a massive scale. Before the invention of the steam engine, we basically burned wood and we had a you know, very sustainable way of dealing with things because we didn't really need that much energy. And this machine that was able to produce so much power needed a lot of power. Actually, we needed carbon rich energy forms like coal or gas or oil that we didn't use in the, in the beforehand to be able to uh, produce so much energy. And the whole world became very dependent on fossil fuels. Actually, many of the wars that we have seen over the last 60 years were basically uh, you know, not only human, uh, humanitarian based, but also um, trying to get, to, res to, to, to get the resources to, to, uh, to be able to pump oil and, and other um, fossil fuels. Now, when we are burning fossil fuels, um, of course, we know that this, this carbon is emitted into the atmosphere. And, it's, and we are right now emitting about three times as much carbon into the atmosphere um, as the capacity of the oceans and the land mass can absorb. So we are right now burning, um, burning millions of years of carbon storage in one year. Actually, it's about three million years of carbon storage that we're burning in a single year at the moment. And that's quite a lot because all the carbon that we are burning has once been carbon in the atmosphere um, back in times when the, when the Earth was much, much warmer climate and then you know, was stored under the ground in terms of oil and coal and gas. And now we are emitting this into the atmosphere and um, you know, only the very naive say, you know, um, there's no climate change. I mean, uh, there is. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can take 100 scientists um, and 99 of them will, will tell you they have clear data suggesting that there's climate change. And the, on the other hand, we are burning a resource that is scarce. Uh, it's, it's not there forever. It, 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 it is harder and harder to find oil in large quantities. We have to drill much deeper. Uh, we have to go to fracking and to other unconventional forms of, of getting the oil out in order to feed the world uh, with, with energy needs. And the 
other thing is that we are using this inner energy so inefficiently, so inefficiently, that I think that our children will hold us responsible for our, our actions today. Now, every generation has things that they have to be responsible for for their children's life when they come back in 30 years and ask you, Daddy, what did you think about um, in 2016? And I'll tell you, when we are burning, when we're burning gas or when we are burning petrol in a gas engine, in an internal combustion engine, we get an efficiency of about 20% thermal uh, or energy efficiency. And that has to do is we are taking oil that we, you know, we drill into the ground, we drill into the Gulf of Mexico, 2,000 meters deep, get the oil out. Then we have to transport it around the world, get it, to it in, into a refinery, then we have to boil it to cook it to get um, the refining process to get oil and you know, he heavy oil and, and light oil and diesel and petrol. And you put quite a lot of energy, uh, most of the time electrical en energy, into boiling um, this thing until we get gasoline. Then we transport it to a filling station and you fill it into the tank of your car for quite a lot of euros or for wind. And then you start your engine. And while you start your engine, you're burning this thing without being able to use it, because right now you're standing, and, but you, you have your car for driving, OK? And even if you drive, the engine is constructed as an ancestor of the steam engine, where we actually, um, you know, where we're producing the, the power over the piston, not by cooking water or making steam, but making an explosion and using the expansion forces of the burning uh, fuel to push down this piston. The most energy that we are using is to produce heat, not to produce power. It's only about 20% power and 80% heat in a normal cycle. There are some forms of combustion engines that get a little bit better ratings when you have a diesel engine in a, in a, in a ship, for example, but in a normal car you get about 20%. So if you're spending 100 euros on filling up your tank, you actually only can, you're wasting 80 euros for heating up the environment, only 20 euros propelling your car forward. And many of us think, great, good thing. Actually, I hear people all the time saying, oh, the internal combustion engine will live forever. It's for the next 20 or 30 or 50 years, we will run on diesel and, and uh, um, com internal combustion engines. And people give it names and say it's blue efficiency. It's very, very efficient. No, it's not. And just to give, give you an example how inefficient it is, just think about next weekend, you are inviting some good friends over and you're cooking. And you know the friends that you have invited are fans of a good wine. And they're collecting wines and you know, they have really, really nice stuff. So to give you a present when they come to you, they went into the, into the wine cellar and brought you their most precious bottle of wine that, that they've been keeping for 10 years now. And you are also a wine fan and saying, hey, great, I always wanted to drink this wine. And they say, yeah, it's the last bottle. It's very, you know, cannot even buy it anymore. It's, it's probably only 600 bottles left in the world. And say, oh, okay, we'll drink this together tonight, okay? So you open up the bottle, you smell on the cork, great, just right. And now you're going to the kitchen sink and you're pouring 80% of this wine into the drain. What do you think your, um, your guests will look, you know, look like? I mean, they will look like you'd say, are you crazy? That's a scarce resource. I mean, it's not coming back. You cannot waste it like that and say, blue efficiency. We can still <laughs> drink 20% of it, you know, half a glass for everyone. With the wine, we see how stupid, you know, we, we deal with that. And if, you, if you're driving an internal combustion car, you're not only running on a scarce resource where you can only use about 20% and you're wasting 80%, but you're also putting it up in the atmosphere and, and, and probably scaring um, uh, or to putting, putting in jeopardy the lives of your children, grandchildren, and the children of your grandchildren because the heat is it's, it's, it's warming up. Now, electric cars, 
um, are having a different efficiency grade. Um, an electric motor can produce about 90% of the power you put into the motor into propulsion and only 10% is excess heat. And that's much better. I mean, 20% to 90%, wow. And it can, it can run on locally produced energy on sustainable energy. So if you have a wind turbine or if you have a solar panel, you can actually produce this this, this energy yourself. You're not dependent on some sheikhs in uh, Saudi Arabia or uh, you know, some political incorrect uh, governments in Venezuela or in, you know, <laughs> whatever. No, um, you can make it right here in Hungary or in Germany or in Sweden or in the United States or wherever you want to. And you can do it every time again because you can renew it because every time the sun rises, the energy is there again. And the tipping point is, beforehand, before, before 2016, actually the tipping point is right now, uh, it was much cheaper to buy the gas and to burn it, although we wasted 80%, but this was still cheaper than the, 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 the way to produce electric, electricity with a solar cell. But solar cells have come down in price by 90%, 90%, in the last 15 years. So you're only paying 10% of what you've paid 15 years ago for solar panels. Right now we are at 50 cents per kilowatt peak. It's, it's, it's uh, 50 cents per kilowatt, uh, I'm sorry, it's 500, 500, 500 uh, dollars per kilowatt peak, 50 cents per kilowatt, for per, per, per watt peak. And that is a point at which you can actually produce a kilowatt hour of electrical energy cheaper than burning coal. Right now, there are uh, utilities that used to build coal-fired power plants in the US, in China, in Europe, that's saying, well, coal is too expensive, let's build a solar power plant, because we don't need fuel, um, you know, coal, we don't have to pay CO2 emissions, the sun uh, is free, and um, yeah, you can produce a kilowatt hour cheaper than burning coal. And it's just tipping at the moment. Nobody thought it would, it would be possible 10 years ago. There's, but there's only one problem. The sun is only shining a few hours a day. And if we have a wind turbine, we have to wait for the wind. And there are some days or hours that we don't have that much wind. So what's missing? Storage. Well, storage is an old thing. I mean, if humans hadn't have storage, we would all be dead because we need to store the things that we harvest in the fall for the winter and the spring. And we will do the same thing with energy. And there's one thing that is very important. There's also one device that is becoming cheaper every, every year and is also reaching a certain tipping point, and that is electrochemical storage, a battery. Now, batteries used to be very expensive. Um, and batteries are coming down in price by about 12% um, every year. Um, They're also getting better, about 9 to 10% every year in cycle stability, so how, much, how many times you can charge and discharge them. And they are also getting by about eight, 7 to 8% better in energy density, so how much we can put into a liter of um, battery or a kilogram of battery. So these are three trends that are coming to, uh, together. 12% cheaper every year, 10% uh, um, higher cycle stability, and about 7 or 8% higher energy density. Now we are coming to the point where we can produce electric cars, including their batteries, for a price that is equivalent to building cars with internal combustion engines, with gasoline or diesel engines. And people said, no, it's not going to never be possible because you know, electric cars are always much more expensive than that. No. Actually, we are coming close in, until 2020 to $100 per kilowatt hour um, in batteries, um, which is, you know, compared to today's prices where you pay about 200, half of that. Um, we have scale effects. And you will be able to buy a car um, that um, is as fast as a BMW M3, um, goes about 300 to 400 kilometers, 
you can run it for about one fourth of the price that you pay for gas when you take uh, the electricity. You have much better um, weight distribution in the car because the, 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 the battery is in the floor pan and you don't have a heavy engine in front. So you can, it, it handles uh, a lot better. For the same price or a lower price, and the Model 3 from Tesla is coming out in 2000 and end of 2017, hopefully, or 18. And uh, about half a million people have pre-ordered this car. It's, it's unprevealed. I mean, there's never been a car that's been ordered half a million times before anyone has even had the chance of test driving it or getting a catalog or uh, getting the specs. And those are just the first half a million people. It's a very, very important thing to, to look at. Now, China, on the other hand, is at the brink of environmental issues in their big cities where you, where, where you have quite a lot of emissions in the cities where they are thinking about banning internal combustion cars from their city. Norway has just announced that un, uh, from 2025 on, you cannot buy internal combustion engine cars. And I would, I would project that in 10 years from now, for most of us, internal combustion cars will look kind of funny to us. I mean, today it's, it's normal. Um, we have a starter and we have ignition. Ignition, and we have um, we, we have little explosions uh, happening all the time. We have a we have a sound. Yes, we have an, a tailpipe where you know we put the exhaust out and stuff like that. We have different gears, and we have to have a clutch to match the speed of the motor with the with the turning of of the things. And if you look at it from a different perspective, I mean, it's like you know very old technology. And in ten years from now, I'm pretty sure that your children will ask you. Tell me about the, you know, back then in 2016, way back in the past, did you really have to start up a car and, you know, uh, to push two different pedals in order to get it moving and uh, you had to stand on a traffic light and the engine would have to run all the time, although you didn't need it just to keep the, to, 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 to keep the, the things uh, running. It will be totally different. And, those of you who have not driven an electric car um, should do so because once you've driven an electric car, you will realize that this is a better concept. You have the full talk, the full um, yeah, talk moment or acceleration at zero RPM. So if you're standing at a traffic light with a equally powered electric car to a conventional gas, ca gas car, the gas car has no chance at all to catch you because it has to rev and you know, go fast. It corners much better, it's much easier to drive um, because you don't, have, you don't have to shift, or there's no shifting uh, whatsoever in that. And the funny thing is there's many people who doubt that they want to have an electric car. And those who have electric car have never, never found anyone who said, yeah, electric cars are nice, but my next car is going to be a, a nice six-cylinder or eight-cylinder car again. Once they have it, it's there. And we are at a tipping point at which for the next three to four years, we will reach a point at which the electric car business is really going to explode. So when I look at the car market right now, I would say com compared to popcorn, we are at an oil temperature of about 155 degrees. Um, so we don't really had the popcorn, or the, the popping experience yet. But remember, once it pops, it goes fast. VW or Volkswagen has announced that they will have electric cars in every segment um, in the next uh, few years. They will, they will um, showcase the new electric car for China in, uh, on the auto show in Paris in, in October this year, 2016. Daimler has just announced that they will have an electric car in every category and that they are going into trucks and buses electrically. BMW has done the same, the Chinese are doing the same. We are monitoring about 30 different startups in the world that are going into electric mobility. We just predict there might be a problem. And the problem is um, the supply of the components that we need to build these, um, these uh, machines. When we are going into an exponential, it's going to be big. Now, why is Elon Musk with Tesla building a battery factory in the middle of nowhere in Nevada? 
where he builds a new oops, where he builds a new factory that actually has the capacity of um, almost doubling the amount of batteries being produced in the world with this one factory. Actually, it's a it's a factory that can produce as much batteries as all com all uh, factories can produce it right now. And the math is very simple. We are looking at a huge market. Right now, those of you who don't have an electric car in your garage, you have about 300 grams of lithium-ion batteries in your life. And that is about a battery in an iPhone has about 25 grams of lithium-ion battery. Uh, if you have an iPad or you know, a, a, a yeah, pad computer, it's about 50 grams of lithium-ion battery. If you have a laptop, you have a bit between 180 and 250 grams of lithium-ion battery in there. So let's say you have about 300 grams of lithium-ion batteries. And now you're going online and ordering a Model 3 from Tesla. Well, no big deal. I mean, you can order it. But once it's delivered, you have a car that has 300 kilograms of lithium ion batteries in it. Now, from 300 grams to 300 kilograms is the factor 1,000. So you're not only doubling your amount of batteries you need, you're not only you know, 10 times or 100 times, no, a thousand times as much battery do you, do you need on the day you get your Model 3 delivered, or you know, Nissan Leaf, or Renault Zoe, or whatever. Now, even if only a tenth of all new cars is being delivered as an electric vehicle, we are looking at a number times 100, 100 times as much batteries. And components to power electric motors, or power electronics, or charging equipment will have uh, equally um, you know, a very, very big upside where we're not talking about increasing our production five or f you know, probably 10% or something, but we're talking 100 or 1,000% in, in some results. So we believe that we will see what we call a pick cycle. A pick cycle is, um, <laughs> I've been taught, I've, I've studied economics, and in economics, you're know, being told that um, when the price for pigs is going up, many farmers think, okay, if the price is that high, I should you know, put the cows aside and you know, raise pigs because I can earn more money. But it takes a while to raise them. And until they are ready to be sold, the price goes down. So we believe that in the next two or three years, the battery prices and component prices for electric cars will Basically, what they've been doing is going down, and they will go up a little bit, and they will fall even deeper until 2026, so 10 years from now. I don't believe that you can buy internal combustion engines anymore. Probably one or two exotic cars, you know, like a 911 or some sort of uh, Ferrari, but look close. Even the most modern Ferraris cannot deliver the power without electric motor components. And even if you buy a Ferrari, the fastest car right now, you get half an electric car. So um, energy and electric mobility come together. And this missing element that, we, that, uh, that you told me, storage. Now, if you get an electric car, you have about, depending on the model, between 20 and 100 kilowatt hours of storage. Now, that's so much storage that you can power your whole your, your home for a few days, probably a week with that. And it draws, it, you know, the resistance for companies or for utilities right now to put more solar and wind, although it's cheaper in, is because they don't have this, the storage. If you have electric cars, they will make it cheaper for the utilities to put up solar and wind because they know how to put the energy where they want to do it. And every battery has a IP address, an internet uh, address, where they can actually load it and then find it. So these things are pulling themselves very much. And to make a prognosis uh, today, I think in the next 10 years, uh, actually in the next five years, electric mobility will boom like crazy, absolutely, worldwide. And there are some factors that can even accelerate that, for example, when China switches over to, to, to uh, electric mobility, but the trend is already, um, already there.
Last um, tipping point for today, and that is not a technical tipping point. It has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. It has nothing to do with energy. It has nothing to do with mobility. It has to do with humans or with um, people. Now, we see a value shift in our societies. And the value shift is that um, back in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, we thought that if you had enough money, you could buy everything. I mean, you probably see in the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen. Uh, I think it was in the 80s or 90s in, in New York. And they had the belief that if you made so much money, you could buy everything. And they found out, no, you cannot buy friendship, and you cannot buy love, and you cannot buy integrity. Um, and we are at the point at which money is becoming less important to people than a social network, than um, working or living in an environment that they respect and they are being respected. The funny thing is, we are talking about company cultures more and more and that this is something that is very important in the future, especially when we look at the demographics. Now, we are all getting older. The, um, the, every year, so when you celebrate New Year's Eve this year, first, uh, 31st of December, to the, you can not only celebrate the new year, but you've gained statistically four months of increased living time. So um, actually, right now, every year that goes by increases your life expectancy by four months. Even the living, not only the, new, the newborn, if you live healthy, it's, 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 it's amazing. Um, but on the other hand, we don't produce enough children at the moment. Um, throughout all countries, or most countries, uh, some African companies, so, uh, companies <laughs> countries, uh, that still produce that. But you know, you look at China, you look at Japan, you look at the most you know Asian like like South Korea, you look at the U.S., the European Union, uh, even South America. You see that the um, the amount or the the number of ch of children per woman um, is is dropping below the sustainable threshold, which is 2.1 uh, statistic um, children per woman. Uh, and we are in Europe by at uh, 1.4. Um, China is at 1.15 um, ch children per woman. Um, so we're decreasing. And it's becoming harder and harder over the next 520 weeks, the next 10 years, to attract employees, to attract um, people who are willing to work for a company. The funny thing is they're not going to work for the ones who pays them the, much, the most money, but who have something um, more to offer. A family, a attitude towards their work, um, the value for their innovative power or their creativity, or their skills that they're bringing into the equation. Now, you probably noticed that with your children. I don't know if it's the same in Hungary or you know, when you're from Germany, you probably know it. I'm living in Switzerland, and I have a 15-year-old daughter. And she's, um, she's nice, uh, puberty right now. Um, and I, I look into her room, and I say, well, this is a total mess. So you know, I'm still, um, you know, she's not 18, so I can t still tell her what to do. So I uh, open the door and say, hey, you, know, you've, you clean up this mess until 6 o'clock tonight. Otherwise, no pocket money for the next two weeks, or no allowance. Does she clean up the room? No. Money is not an incentive for her. As long as the, the Wi-Fi is on and the, the refrigerator has some, she, I would have cleaned up my room if my father said, I need, I'm not going to get money, uh, pocket money. It was important for me, not for her. But if I say, you clean up the room, otherwise you don't get your phone back. Hmm? She cleans it up. Now, she's not worried because the phone is 300 euros worth. It's, it's not about the money. It's about her social network. It's about her friends. It's about her communication, her ideas, her, her, her role in a community. And I know, people, you know our children spend far too much time on their phones, but they're communicating. And we are humans. We want to communicate. We want to live in a, in a, in a community. 
Now, in three years from now, she will choose where to work at the latest. Probably even, well, I don't know, if these studies, whatever. In the, in the next few years, she will go to an employer and um, what will she look for? Will she look for one that pays 500 euros more than the other? No. She will look at them and say, okay, tell me about your vision. Tell me about your attitude towards things. Are you, is, is the community that I'm going into a healthy community that I want to be part of? And we would say in the next 520 weeks, companies are evolving to something that we call value communities. Uh, of Deutsch, Wertegemeinschaften. Now I have to explain that. If you think you, not sh you should not only sit at home or at work, but you should do something for yourself, you probably want to join a club. And whether it's um, you know, the firefighters or a political party or an environmental group or a sports club or whatever, you can do that decision by making it very rational. You can make a table and say, okay, what is the monthly or the annual fee that I have to pay to go into this club? And make it a money decision. But you're not doing that. You're going to this club and you look at the people who are members of this club. And you, and you think to yourself, do I want to belong to this community? Do I want to interact with these people? Do I want to spend my hours and my time in this community, and will I come home with a smile on my face and say, hey, that was really great, and I'm doing something important. Now, if this is the case, you're joining this club. Relatively, un it's not important if they are cheap or expensive, it's a matter of heart and in, in your, your, your stomach that tells you, you know, this is right. Now, in 10 years, there will be so few new employees that you have to fight for them. And you cannot get the right people that you want by offering them more money, but you have to offer them a vision, a culture that they want to be part of, a community that they say, this is my second family, and a job that they say, I can apply my skills and my personality in that and work for that. So the last tipping point is basically, although we are moving into a, a time of artificial intelligence, of more robots, of you know, much, much more technology in our lives, the human element is going to be much more important in this thing. And it's so important to found a community and a set of values that uh, enables people to be attracted by this company and to uh, be able to join them to, uh, to do that. So, 2016. September, let's see, 6, 2016. It's only 520 weeks until September 6, 2026. Um, during that time, we will see quite a lot of changes. And there are those people who say changes are bad. I mean, nobody knows if they are coming and you know, it messes up all the things that we've planned and stuff like that. And others say, well, changes are good because um, you can do things that you have not done yet. You can innovate. You can, you can be part of that change. Can we predict the future? Not in all cases, but if we understand a system, if we apply basic physics or mathematical skills and the knowledge of what is happening and look into the world, if we probably take out our iPhone that we didn't had 520 weeks ago to be able to look on Wikipedia and say, hey, you know, this is not guessing when the popcorn is going to pop, but this is knowledge. I can do that. And I think there's never been a time with more opportunities than the next 520 weeks to come. With massive change in the industry, but a lot of chances and opportunities for those who take the chances of transforming mobility, production, energy, um, the, uh, the culture that we are living in, and the working environment there that we are working in. So let's get down to Earth again. So this was our helicopter view of the next 520 weeks. For tonight, let's make some popcorn and look very closely. Who will be too nervous and thinks, you know, it's going to, be to, 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 to come much faster than everybody thinks. Those who say, nah, it's never going to come. It's, it's, yeah. 
or those who want to understand what we are really in. And that is uh, what Future Research is all about. Um, for your attention, I thank you very much, and I see every one of you in the future. Thank you.